Augmented Reality Dirt Podcast, Episode 53. Does Microsoft HoloLens cause neurological damage? Welcome to the Augmented Reality Dirt Podcast with your host, Joseph Rampola. Exploring cutting edge and emerging technologies that influence society, cybercrime, and our legal system. everybody to the Augmented Reality Dirt Podcast. I am your host, Joseph Rampola, and we are back with episode 53. Better late than ever, here we are, and we have the big question. Does Microsoft HoloLens cause neurological damage? And we bring in some of our experts, and we are going to have a great episode. We have Shane Pace and Gary Hare, both uh, doctors. And they are going to chime in on, is this really something that we should pay attention to? Apparently, the CEO of Magic Leap thinks that maybe Microsoft HoloLens could do that. So we're going to get the dirt, we're going to get the skinny, and we're going to get ask our experts and have them weigh in on this uh, recent news that came out. But before we go any further, remember, it doesn't make a difference if you are an augmented reality newbie or an AR veteran. There is something here to learn and share in the world of AR. And as a reminder, our show notes, everything that you hear today, you can find that at ardirt.com forward slash 53, because this is episode 53, and you will get everything you need to know. So how easy. And I would not be happy with myself if I did not mention that you absolutely need to download our free Augmented Reality Dirt podcast app. Did I say it was free? Yes, I did. It's free. There's no reason. If you want to get every single episode and get easy access to our show notes and find out all the information, you could even um, contact us via our app. It's free. Very simple. If you have an Android phone. Go to ardirt.com forward slash Google app. And if you are on the iOS, you have an Apple phone, iPad, uh, doesn't make a difference. Go to ardirt.com forward slash Apple app. And it's that simple, folks. All right. So let's get going here. Let's get right into this interview. And it really is a fascinating interview. And just so you know, it's, it is a little bit long. So we, are not having Bobby Simpson on the show. We're not doing links of the show. We're getting to this goodness. We hope to still keep it under an hour, but we wanted just to get this out here because it really is an awesome, awesome show, and I really hope you enjoy it. So sit back and enjoy. Okay, folks, we have two very special guests, and I don't think we've ever had this much brain power on the podcast at one time. But we are here with Dr. Shane Pace, and we're also here with Dr. Gary Hare, and we are going to be talking all about the some comments that were made by the Magic Leap CEO, and we're going to talk about kind of getting into the brain and the potential neurological effects that might take place, potentially bad ones, and how it might affect the industry. So, gentlemen, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great. Good, Joe. Thank you. It's great to have you. And now I've done research on you and I've seen your your bios and I've seen all of the research. There's been a lot of uh, uh, publications that have been made in in the American Psychological Association and uh, IEEE and, and all of these really big periodicals that are out there. Why don't each of you kind of give us a little bit of background and kind of how your past experiences have kind of are moved into this this AR or this geeky realm that's that's taken place? So, 
Shane, why don't you uh, start off? Great. Yeah. Thanks for having us on, Joe. The world of AR was exposed to me through Digital Hollywood um, with AFI a few years ago. And, and Gary loves to tell a story in when we're together that <clears throat> we were sitting there watching these displays and we got to see a, a brief rudimentary display of uh, some very simple AR. And he looked over, my mouth was hanging open because I'd never seen anything like this. And for the next 15 minutes, I sat there silent and motionless with my mouth hanging open. He, he was concerned that I actually had a stroke. But in reality, I, I was completely dumbfounded by what I, by what I had seen. Uh, this is the first examples of AR that I'd ever seen. And I knew right then and there that that was, that was my new calling as a psychologist. Uh, and at the time, a psychologist in training. But So I focused on that. I focused on uh, visual perception and how we perceive uh, and understand and experience AR. Um, we're starting to get into some of the, the educational outcomes of AR as well as some of the emotional engagement and outcomes of AR. We've traveled around the world to talk. We've uh, been at uh, ISMAR through IEEE. We've been to APA, American Psychological Association, numerous times, and uh, IEEE, ACM. So we, we like to get out there and try to spread the gospel of AR from the psychological uh, perspective. Very nice, very nice. And how about you, Gary? Yeah, I well, I, I go back. Uh, I spent about 20 years in the games and simulations world. So I started some gaming companies, started to uh, design and produce the first couple titles for Lucas Games, went on and uh, developed my own company. I ended up being a publisher and running all of Philips's digital businesses in Europe for a couple of years. And so I was uh, very immersed in the whole notion of games and simulations. And, and one of the things I noticed that is that we only research things after the fact, which was kind of weird. And so we so so research and, and just generating some knowledge before we design something was almost never done. So I stumbled back into academia a while ago and, and uh, really was involved in starting this doctoral program in media psychology. And I wanted to try and figure out how we could bring research to design. And AR was extraordinarily convenient. So we, we looked at it and saw a power there that we hadn't seen in any other media. Uh, what I'm doing right now is that I'm, I'm really focused on, on how augmented reality can, number one, in, increase the emotional impact of built environments. I'll say more about that later. And then number two is how it can be used for social advocacy. And I think it has extraordinary promise. And most of the stuff we see, uh, most of the applications are, you know, in the commercial space as they should be in the medical space, which has tremendous promise, but very little in terms of saying how you could put real time data in somebody's hands for the purpose of social change. And so that's my focus at the moment. I'm, I'll be making an announcement here in about 60 days where through the university, I get back to my design roots and we actually have a mechanism to make some of these things. Very nice. Well, I hope to get the dirt on that as soon as you're able to announce your uh, release there or what you guys are doing. So that sounds as, as the universe, as the uh, university, we hope it's not overly dirty. But yeah, I'll make sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Awesome, guys. Well, you know, we're going to have all of your uh, information, your your biographies, all the periodicals, publications, and that sort of thing. We're going to have that all in our our show notes. And I think the thing that's really cool that excites me with having both of you guys on here is that, you know, speaking to both of you, you guys have been in this space for a while and, uh, you know, s since the beginning. And I think that's what's really exciting because, you know, being at I IEEE or being at, at Ismar and kind of having these you know, these discussions and, you know, I was talking to you guys uh, offline and telling me about the different panels and kind of having these discussions that are so important because let's face it, kind of seeing the way the body works and the mind and how it reacts to technology and to see what those effects are and, and kind of, uh, Gary, as you mentioned, you know, you can use it for social advocacy. And I know, Shane, a lot of the work that you're doing there, there is a lot of medical uses that you can use with augmented reality and technology and be able to use it from a, a cognitive uh, psychology way to improve people's lives. So I, I, th I think that, that it's really important, the work that you guys are doing. And are you seeing other people in your field, guys, that are getting it, that, that the light bulb's coming on for them? Or, or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, from, from what I've seen, the psychology community can be pretty fickle, but there is definitely, uh, especially amongst media psychologists, there's definitely a lot of attention starting to be paid to this technology. Hopefully more and more as we go, because Gary and I can't do all the research by ourselves. 
So hopefully we start to get a flood of people that become interested in this. Uh, not too many, though. The, the thing for me that I'm really excited about is over the last five, six years that we've been going to all these conferences and talking, we've been kind of the odd ducks because we go to these technology conferences to share what we know about psychology because, let's face it, going to psychology conferences to talk about technologies is okay, but they're not the ones that are creating this, this technology. So going to these tech conferences and telling them about the psychological implications, the potentials, the pitfalls, the ethics, we've been accepted, but that's been met at times with skepticism. Like, well, you know, thanks for the information. That's great, but that doesn't really apply to me because I'm making this really cool three-dimensional uh, AR application that we can use in the real world. But finally, there's enough steam starting to, to be produced to, to lend people to say, okay, this stuff actually is important that we need to know about this. So for me, I'm, I'm excited about that component of it. I used to do a bit of uh, consulting, mostly strategic consulting with media companies, and it was it was revolved around, you know, their digital media strategy or what have you. A lot of companies were thinking about getting into the games business and knew nothing about games, and some of them blew, in one case, $250 million. Uh, and if they would have just listened to me for a day and a half, they wouldn't have – they could have saved $250 million. Uh, in the AR world, like any new world, it's largely – doing things because we can do them you know you're like blown away wow we can do this let's do one of those and, and that's the, you know that's the way all new technology starts it's not a big deal but i'm starting to see now i don't work all over the place i work with no more than two companies at a time and i'm starting to see uh invitations what most recent from a fairly large venture capital company asking if i would work with their New media, mostly AR, VR portfolio, that kind of stuff. So that's, people are paying attention. They, they want to look at things from a strategic point of view. If research and the science dovetails with that, all the better. But, you know, so I, I think the industry becomes more thoughtful as it matures. And I think we're seeing AR about there now. And VR is probably not far behind. Interesting. Very interesting. I, I totally agree. And, you know, this kind of dovetails into what we're going to be talking about, about how the new technologies potentially can affect the body. And specifically, as you know, Magic Leap, the CEO, Roni Abovitz, basically came out and had said some statements. Now, I guess the media kind of took it a different way, but one of the articles I read, it said that recently that the CEO of the Google-backed startup Magic Leap, he claimed that Microsoft's HoloLens could cause permanent brain damage and to no one's surprise, uh, it says here that you know Magic Leap has a a better and safer competing product. So <laughs> I I kind of wanted to bring you guys in here because you guys are are the experts in this field. You know you've been working in uh, in psychology and you know through all of your research and stuff. And I kind of want to bring in the expertise here about is there any validity based on 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 your experiences and research that this is a legitimate claim is something like the hollow lens. Is that something that could, could cause, you know, brain damage? But Shane, one of the things was, uh, you said that they actually, uh, clarified, uh, magically clarified their statement. So what, what did they say when they clarified their statement? Uh, yeah, they basically said, uh, a spokesman from, uh, Magic Leap said that, quote, we believe if technology is not replicating all of the psychologic important parameters of a light field, which the human optoneurosystem requires, it can cause a spectrum of temporary and or permanent neurologic deficits, which changes the topic a little bit away from don't use your Oculus or you'll go blind kind of uh, comments that, that uh, Abovitz had made. At least that's what the press really picked up on. You know, that, that, that clarifies things a little bit. It brings it back to the reality of, okay, can this have a neurological effect on you? Of course it can, because you're introducing visual stimuli into the visual system. And when you're talking about using 3D, especially within an enclosed environment like a, a VR a headset, you can start having some neurological issues. Now, let's get real about that. There is no scientific report in the literature at this time that says this will cause brain damage. What it can cause, which anybody that's used any of these uh, AR heads or VR headsets in particular, for more than a few minutes, especially with the video game environment, is it causes nausea in some people, causes headaches, causes eye fatigue. And can those be considered neurologic deficits? Yeah, sure, a headache can be a neurologic deficit. But is it brain damage? No, not in my opinion. 
You know, it sounds a lot like marketing mudslinging to me that a lot of these issues go back to the research that was done in Boeing in the 1950s and 60s about heads-up display for pilots. And so there's tremendous concern about it. On the consumer side, we heard the same argument when movie theaters went from standard format to cinemascope. And we started to see arguments saying that this is going to mess up people's orientation, it's going to affect their brain, it affects their vision, you know, on and on it goes. But I'm not a neuroscientist, but we have relationships with some of the world's most famous neural labs. So if they really want to test it, I mean, if they really want to find out, take it into the lab. If they get the findings they anticipate, they've got tremendous data for marketing and for, and for differentiation of product. If they don't, then they just have to quit talking about it. As you guys are talking, I mean, the thing I'm thinking about is that if I start, if you think about the Oculus Rift and that sort of thing, like virtual worlds and, and Gary, you've been involved in, you know, we had a conversation where you've been involved in virtual worlds even before Second Life. So as these different technologies are being used, could you say something you said, you know, we only research or generally we only research after the fact, but isn't there already a body of material and evidence to a certain extent? And I know, you know, a lot of these AR glasses, that that's all new per se, but isn't this, there, there are a lot of data already to show that there isn't potential brain damage? I'm guessing that hasn't there already been some experiments that have already been done to show that probably it's not dangerous? Quite a few, actually. I mean, most of them dealt with visual inputs, you know, so most of the research that you see on visual input is saying, uh, does it matter to the brain if you have multiplane information? I'm more than showing my age now, but we go back to the 1930s when Disney first used the multiplane camera. Now, there wasn't a lot of research done around it, but it was interesting because they thought that this was going to somehow have an impact on the kids that were watching animated films. So suddenly, instead of having one plane of information with a little pasty character bouncing around, you could have six planes of information all in motion at the same time. Think back to how long ago that was. And there was cons there was a legitimate concern about it. And uh, Disney actually started to do some research on it at the time. Uh, same thing was probably said about things like Avatar, where, where Avatar used the 3D and the background plane to really create a compelling virtual world and then put the drama and the action in the foreground plane. Interesting thing. Did Avatar affect us uh, just viewing it not the not the story itself but it did affect us differently than if it would have been done you know in all animation or or, or all or all full, real motion those are the kinds of things that people think about but they haven't been worth researching because we just assume that you know hey this is just normal technology moving forward in a given area where we have gotten really interested though is from a cognitive point of view do people understand what you're displaying differently? Uh, this is really interesting in AR. VR is a little bit different animal because VR is actually blocking your field of view. There's a whole bunch of things we can talk about there. In AR, think of it like this. Most of commercial AR, the background plane is known. You've got a product, you've got an environment, you've got this or that. And you're trying to figure out ways how to enhance it in the foreground plane. But, but let's look at that background plane for just a second. If, I, if I'm familiar with that, if I know the background plane going in, I'm going to respond to it differently than if I'm not. If the background plane is unfamiliar to me, and now I put something in the foreground plane, I'm going to respond differently. And this is where uh, some of the work we do uh, it comes into play. Fairly simple eye-tracking technologies can be linked to almost real-time analysis. And we can show you, and I've shown you two examples, we can... We can show you exactly what people look at when they look at a frame or when they look at any media, for that matter. So uh, I've got, uh, Joe, two things that you can post. There's a ghost map and a heat map. Uh, the heat map shows where the eye goes when it looks at, a, uh, what looks at any source of media. And then the ghost map basically looks at what it doesn't see. So the black sections of the ghost map, people aren't looking at at all. The burnt through sections into the background plane, that's what's calling people's attention. That's the kind of research that can be done. It's, it's not terribly expensive. It's not even all that difficult. But so that we know where people's attention is being called to the background plane before we start building the foreground plane. Doing that in a very simple fashion will give us an awful lot of information about our own designs. 
you know, when we when we talk about the 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 deficits or the differences between AR and VR, obviously, you know, obviously we know, you know, off the bat, most of the people listening to the show will obviously know what uh, the differences are. But when you're talking about VR and you're in that enclosed space, one of the inherent problems that we have with VR is that you take yourself completely out of the scenario. The only thing that you have is your visual awareness of the situation. You are taking yourself out. That's problematic because anytime you take yourself out of your visual field, it creates a disconnect and it starts to create some of those problems with nausea and balance and, and moving around. And it's something that some of the VR companies are starting to understand is you've got to have forward facing sensors or cameras that can at least put my hands, my feet, my torso when I look down or put my hands in front of me because it takes away that disconnect. The thing I love about AR over VR is that AR gives us the opportunity to maintain our real world understanding while we're experiencing this really cool, potentially 3D technology. And the suspension of disbelief with VR is much more difficult. And until they are creating real time, real vision, three dimensional movies that we can interact with, which they're starting to do very well now. When you're immersing me in a completely digital environment, it takes a lot of effort on my part to say, okay, this isn't fantasy, this is real. But when I can't be part of it, I can't see myself physically in it, that suspension of disbelief is even more difficult. Um, but with AR, you don't have that. With AR, I'm taking digital information, putting it in your real world, in your visual field, and we still have that ability to see the background plane or the real world plane while we're experiencing this uh, this digital side. So I think that's one of the benefits that AR has over VR. And that may be one of the reasons that uh, Abovitz at Magic Leap is, is making some of the claims because, let's face it, AR is much easier to use and has a much smaller effect perceptually on, uh, on the user than VR does. I think, too, that VR is probably going to have to go after very specific use. So we can certainly see this gaming, you know, let's assume that somebody doesn't have nausea or whatever from using it. I mean, you can certainly see how you'd use it in a gaming environment. You can certainly see how you'd use it in, a, you know, in things like a medical environment. I mean, there's a lot of environments where it could have tremendous value. The, the State Department, for example, tries to pre-train our diplomats about the embassy they're about to go to. So they know everything about the embassy. They know the escape routes and the hallways and what's on the fourth floor. Well, that lends itself, that whole visual training lends itself to VR immediately. So anything like that that requires sort of pre-visualization of an environment could be incredible. But there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle this morning talking about how they're going to have VR glasses at the, at the Warriors basketball games and that they immerse you into the game so that no matter what seat you have, you could look like you're seated right next to the, the player. That sounds pretty cool, except I don't think it'll work. And that, that's because there's this very well-known concept of defensible space. And I'm not going to block my entire field of view when I'm in a crowd. And most people aren't either. They might put it on for a second. But then the need for defensible space kicks in. And I don't think they'll put it on when they're seated with 16,000 people. I just don't think that's going to happen. They, they could put them in a booth or something where they already have that space to find. So I, th I think the application of VR is going to be most interesting. And it, it will it will naturally evolve, but it would be nice for the companies to be thoughtful of, uh, about it in the front end, and I'm sure they are. AR, on the other hand, it raises a really interesting question, and that is what's the impact of real-time data? Not just in the consumer's hands, but in the citizen's hands. So does real-time data matter? And I think it matters more than just about any media that's preceded it excluding television, which has mattered forever. But the impact of real-time data cannot be understated. It, 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 it's extraordinary. I think also, too, that we've become accustomed to we need that real-time data. You know, we expect that real-time data. I mean, I don't know if you, you, know, you pick up a newspaper – and you you know that the news is old already. You know it's, it's so much it's so much more secure if I go on the internet and I know exactly what's happening right now. And I, I so I think that we all expect that real time data to take place. You know it's interesting how you guys talked about VR and AR and and going back, Shane, how you discussed about how your body just expects when you look downward 
that you're going to see your legs and you're going to see your arms and, and those sort of, uh, you have to kind of show your brain that, you know, you are connected. And I, I think there's something that, I mean, it's really important the, that, that you need that and that you could lose that if, you know, in some of these uh, VR realms, if you don't, you know, have, have that taking place. What's interesting, guys, I want to kind of bring this in is that there was uh, an article that just came out in the Daily Mail, uh, .co.uk, that talked about this this 360 camera headset or, or, or this camera that you walk around with and it captures your entire environment, uh, 360, wherever you are. And what they were trying to do was they were hooking it up to another person who would have an Oculus Rift. So they would be able to be sitting there and looking – like let's say it's a conference call. So uh, Shane, you're talking to Gary and Gary has this 360 – camera, you could put on your Oculus Rift in a remote location and see like you're in the room looking all around, like having that conversation. And it was taking, you know, not a taking, you know, real environment or even potentially a real time environment because it, it has the ability to transmit. And it was so there was kind of some a little bit more of bringing the reality, um, you know, the, the true environment, I should say immediately in that in that VR headset. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see where we might move with that because I was always the believer and following Second Life in Virtual Worlds that this was cr incredible and there were so many things you could do, but AR was taking that all and bringing it out to the real world and I thought the applications were just so much more and, and kind of, Gary, you, you kind of mentioned that point indirectly as you're talking just like, you know, I wouldn't close my eyes in a, a basketball arena because I won't have my wallet five minutes later, right? If you have one of those things on. But, um, the uses of it, but it's, it's kind of interesting because depending on what you're using it, there, there might be a lot of other ways where somebody can follow that diplomat, let's say, as like a personal security guard, even though they're not there with them, they could actually, you know, monitor them in a, uh, a virtual environment. And see what they're seeing and walking around and maybe kind of be that extra set of eyes or that guardian angel per se, utilizing it in an Oculus Rift type virtual environment and explaining, all right, go this way, go that way. And, and kind of real time situations are taking place where you might have a high profile ambassador where, you know, let's take Benghazi for a second and I'm not getting uh, political here, but – you might actually, if he had a guardian angel per se, might have been able to steer him based upon satellite views or whatever to a safe house or a place that they could move. So there's just so many overlap, I should say, of taking place between the AR and, and the VR. It's interesting. The um, Disney at their at their th at their amusement parks did the first 360 theaters in the round. You probably remember those if you've been to Disneyland or Disney World or whatever. Mm -hmm. Circle and Vision. The Circle Vision. So the first Circle Vision uh, was the GE Theater. So it was a big, giant, circular room with screens all around it. And it was what they did was quite spectacular. And the audience all fell over, crashed into each other, fell to the ground. The kids trembled over their brother, all that kind of stuff. They had to put handrails in there because it was so disorienting for, in those days, real-time use that you just literally couldn't do it. So when you start to look at this kind of thing, you start to ask yourself the question, well, well what are the applications? I'm sure that sort of thing will be sold saying, wouldn't your, wouldn't your go to meeting meetings be cooler if you had a 360 view of the room? The answer to that question is no. And it's a no in a whole bunch of different ways. But wouldn't it be cool if you could experience Burning Man in a 360 environment? Well, from an education, from an entertainment point of view, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Could you use it on surveillance cameras and get a 360 view of the street corner instead of just a sort of rotating single view? That might be interesting. Could you pre-visualize stuff? Yes. Might you do exactly what you said with, with surveillance and security in any environment? Possibly. So this, this all comes down to saying, what's the utility of the technology? A lot of times we think of every technology as a new media. It is, that's not necessarily the case. And so that just, it comes down to specific use in so many, in so many cases. Yeah, that's a very good point. No doubt. One of the things, um, that it, it, when I read that article and then hearing you talk about it, especially the guardian angel concept, one of the things I kept thinking of is if I'm sitting in a board meeting, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the high profile executive board, some of which are making millions of dollars. 
and I'm on the outside looking in, so to speak, it gives me a little bit of a, a potential advantage over the people in that room, especially if they can't see me. Because I'm able to, to sit and look and observe and make comments based on just the visualizations that I have. It almost creates a, a social psychological dilemma where I've got an advantage over others because they can't see me. They can't see my facial expression, my body language. So there's, there's things that could definitely be looked at from that perspective as well. But as far as the security implications go, I think that they're, they're tremendous. They're absolutely tremendous. Whether it's a guardian angel following somebody around as security, although you better hope if you're replacing uh, bodyguards with, uh, you know, these camera systems that the person that's wearing that camera can run like hell in a <laughs> moment of crisis. But there's, there's other implications too. Like Gary had mentioned, um, the whole concept of being able to, to know an environment without actually being in that environment. I mean, you can see the, the potential for firemen. I mean, if we mapped every single building in New York City, although it would be a, uh, an, an endeavor to do that, a fireman could, you know, throw on a pair of AR headsets and still have his full field of view, but then have that augmented vision of the real-time layout of the building. He can see exactly where he's going, even in a smoke-filled room. So I think that the 3D camera, the three, 360 cameras have a pretty uh, in, incredible potential. Actually, to go to, if I could, uh, Joe, to go to follow up on Shane's comment, uh, one of the very earliest things we did, one of our students did, that they, uh, they grew up in Colorado, and there had just been a wildfire, a brush fire, where several firemen were killed. And they said, you know, I ought to be able to build an AR app that could help people out of that kind of situation. So what he did, basically using geomapping and, and, and radio frequencies, so radio frequencies travel uh, closer to the ground than, than satellite imagery does, you simply had a, an augmented reality app with arrows, forward, left, right, backward, whatever, that led you from your position to a safe position in real time. And and so a firefighter or any emergency responder, if they found themselves into an environment that it looked like they couldn't get out of, it could lead you out of that environment. A very simple thing, but based on these uh, this paired technology between geo-information systems and radio frequency mapping. And so that kind of thing you could do with AR. With VR, you can introduce people to an environment that they're unfamiliar with. Well, what, what, one of the, one of the thing, I mean, aside, it was Google, Google Glass was a, I mean, it was a great piece of research. We have a lot of data out of it and that's all good. But the immediate thing that happened was it, the use was banned in your middle school locker room. It was banned in casinos. It was banned in public environment meetings. It was banned everywhere. Everywhere you could record something without the viewers, without the, the the person's permission. It was basically on the road to being banned. So you had a situation where that kind of use was just seen as being inappropriate. 360 stuff is going to be the same. You know, it's not like Shane's going to be able to have a bird's eye view of the board meeting of the stock he just bought. You know, that no way is that ever going to happen. So you really have to say, well, what's, you know, where could it happen? Now, I mean, it certainly could be, from an entertainment point of view, concerts, Burning Man, all that kind of stuff. That could be very cool. But cool isn't good enough. You have to go into saying, what's the specific use that would get to people to use this more than once in a while? And that's the real issue for these good kinds of technologies. You know, Gary, I, I was, of course, I'm always thinking of the evil side of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just reading an article the other day where, you know, there's penetration testers that not only try to hack into a company, you know, to make them stronger, but they also try to physically penetrate. And being able to, a lot of times, they'll walk into banks and walk behind the counter like they're a repairman and start to plug the USB drives into the computers and they're stealing data and customer stuff. And of course, the company hired them to do that. So, you know, no harm, no foul. I'm just thinking with these 360 cameras, if you actually do that as a penetration tester or you're, you're doing intelligence uh, rec reconnaissance, with that, it, it could be extremely dangerous. And then look at that in a virtual environment or a VR environment and, and to be able to use that information uh, against a company. And, and it kind of – I started thinking, Shane, as you mentioned before about having an advantage by watching that. And let's face it. There's a lot of new research and I'm sure you guys have probably worked on research looking at facial, facial movements, you know, showing signs of stress that's taking place and a deception when people are, are lying or people 
are, are showing movements that might be, you know, their reaction to something. Or, you know, now as all these apps show, you know, you could see if you're lying with the app and it'll tell you and stuff. So all of these things kind of all mixing together, I, I just, maybe I'm just negative, but it just seems that there's so many different ways that you could use this in, in a negative way that, you know, to profit from than some of the other ways. So, and my other question, Gary, is the, you know, we talked about, as you said, about the 360 camera and about where, but if I walk into your university and I'm walking through the locker rooms or I'm walking through certain areas, I mean, who's really going to know what I have? Well, yeah, that's true. And, and- but let, let, let's think, let's back up for just a second that all this technology we're talking about, particularly all of the, uh, anything that we could say could be security or surveillance technology, which is most everything. Hayden, the former director of the NSA and CIA said, and I think this was his most interesting thing he ever said. Well, he said two interesting things. Uh, the one was in order to have complete security, we must have total surveillance. And this is the justification for, you know, listening in on our Skype calls. This one probably our cell phones and everything else. So we have to, we have to have surveillance over everything, over every, every piece of data generated. The other thing he said that's kind of cool, but it's unrelated. He said, uh, we kill people based on metadata. Well, visual metadata doesn't really exist in a meaningful way yet, but it certainly could. You know, so let's remember that anything that we can do, even if we said we should, t- if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to fear from your own government and all that stuff. Every other government in the world will be able to do it as well. So those governments that are interested in making sure they have complete surveillance of their citizenry will, will use this technology. So the same technology can be good, can be used on, on one hand, a, a good side, prevention of bad things. On the other hand, the bad side is just a sort of securing those bad things in the hands of the few. I think you just um, illustrated an, another reason why not to wear a uh, VR headset at a basketball game. <laughs> just, <Yeah. laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, I, I, I mean, we could get in a whole different thing, a whole different discussion. It'd be fascinating someday, where where all the sports stadiums are sort of in a tech war, you know, about how much more technology they can put into the stadium environment, it, as if the game itself isn't interesting. Yeah. You know? So there's a tremendous distraction. I mean, the, the 49ers spent like a gazillion dollars on their new Santa Clara Stadium. Then they wonder why nobody's in the seats. And it's because they're all in the clubs drinking and screwing around with the new Wi-Fi and all the new virtual and stuff that they put in there. You go, you, you, you basically brought people to a stadium and then ensured they wouldn't go to the game. Well, I got a story for you. This is a really good tie-in. Is I just went to a New Jersey Devils hockey game the other day, and it was at the uh, Prudential uh, Center in Newark, and that is the first arena that has a 3D laser light show that will project onto the ice and it was unbelievable and i mean and and the devils aren't that good of a hockey team this year so nobody really cared for to see the devils more but it was it was just phenomenal it was the first time i've ever seen it and it just blew me away on it was just like a a movie a, like a a swirling movie that took place on the ice and this 3d you know, projections were just unbelievable. So it was, it was blow away, but it, it kind of shows your point, Gary. You're, you're right on there. Yeah. Did it, did it enhance the game or was it like its own standalone entertainment? It was its own standalone entertainment. It, it was like a, you know, the pre, uh, pre event that took place. And it was just wild though. It was just incredible, but it, it just was a, a new way that, you know, technology, cause somebody mentioned to me, Oh, by the way, you're going to see something really cool. And then it, it blew me away and it kind of, illustrates the importance of projection AR too, because, you know, I always thought that projection AR, eh, that's not going to go anywhere. But then after I saw our cast AR or, or kind of learned some of the stuff they were doing, um, you know, to me, I thought projection AR, you know, there is something that's important with projection AR and, and that can be very useful too, because you don't need that headset per se, you know, right. maybe, you know, and, and, and that was, a reason why projection AR is is something that I think will be very useful for again, as you said, the the you know depends on what its application is. I suspect that GoPro is working on some projection AR, so they've got this. I mean, you know, they've got footage of everything everybody's ever done. But at the surfing championships at the Bonsai Pipeline, they have this extraordinary stuff that most of us normal human beings could ever see or experience. 
actually somebody inside the barrel at the bonsai pipeline in 20 foot surf. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. So now they're talking about saying, okay, well, aside from putting on this website, what else can we do with this? And that is projection AR. I mean, imagine what they could do with it. It'd be amazing. Very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So guys, uh, before we wrap up, um, I want to kind of get back to our original concept. And, you know, I think, Gary, you kind of said that, you know, originally that you suspected that this was more of a, uh, what was it, a bad public relations situation? Uh, what was yeah, your I, said, I said marketing mudslinging. Mu- yeah, marketing mudslinging. And you, you know what I call it? You want to hear what I call it? Let's see if my, my audio will play. I think I smell horse poop. Uh, I don't know if you heard that, but, um, you know, it, but to me, I guess, it, and it comes down to is that, it, so let's just say, you know, this statement is made and Microsoft now says, let's just say that Microsoft took it serious. And I don't think they did, but let's just say they did. And they, they call up you, Gary, they call up you, Shane, uh, and they say, guys, you need to test uh, our hollow lens and make sure it doesn't cause neurological damage. W- what would be like a real brief, how would you tackle that problem? Like, and how would you tackle the research? Like real, like what would be your steps? T- uh, well, I, I, one thing to say about Microsoft is that uh, I was involved with them way back. I know Gates a little teeny bit, not much, but my guess is with this kind of challenge, that's exactly what Gates would have done. He would have said, prove it or we'll do a, we'll do a duel. So what you do is that uh, we, we would take this into one of our labs that we're associated with, the most famous of which is Paul Zach's lab at Claremont University. What Zach does is he exposes people to different types of media while under fMRI. So you can see exactly how the brain's reacting in real time as people are exposed to media. And you'll know from that, you can then begin to extrapolate from that, what regions of the brain light up. So that you can't, uh, in some cases, we lie to ourselves about we think what we think we see, what we think we believe. But in most cases, we're just oblivious to it. But we can tell, you know, when we expose you to media, what part of the brain is reading this. So that then is the first major step toward the conclusion that Magic Leap is trying to make us take. There are a number of other ways to do it, by the way. But And so then from that step, we can start saying, from everything we know about all other kinds of media, if this region of the brain is involved, is that cause for concern? My guess is it is not. But uh, And that would be the first major step we would take. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see somebody like Microsoft say, put your money where your mouth is, uh, you know, and the, the, the duel is on. Right, right. No, I agree. I, I, I don't think they would take it serious. But you said the you said fMRI. Like I've heard of a, an, an MRI, but is that like a, a, just a brain scanner? Just to yeah. be clear is for it- our lay, lay people? Yeah, it, it, it's it's scanning. Your, it, it's the same thing that you do if you went in for a broken shoulder or you're a football player and they're not sure what's wrong with you. Uh, it's just that it's, in this particular case, linked directly to the brain. The uh, the brain's ability is extraordinary. I, I'll give you a very, very quick example. People are, you show people a photograph, right? So the, the, the famous one is a photograph of a, of a crowd. It's about in 1860, 1870, downtown London. Black and white, sort of grainy photograph. That's all you show them. And then the brain is uh, uh, basically the, the person to give it access. And, and, and I don't mean access like we can page through it. To an index of about 900,000 photographs. And just on the brain waves, right? So you show them the photograph, and it's just the areas of the brain that is reading this photograph. That's it. It's just brain chemistry, nothing more. That brain chemistry is then used to sort those 900,000 photographs and find the one that they think is most similar to the photograph that your eyes saw. And it's unbelievable, totally unbelievable what the outcome is. It's almost uncanny. Now, this is just replicating what the eye sees with the chemistry from the brain. And so this can be done quite readily. You know, and so when you, so when you think of the, the, the power of the brain, which we probably understand 2% of it, but the power of the brain to do this kind of stuff, uh, it, it would be fairly straightforward to say, okay, Magic Leap, okay, Microsoft, we're bringing it to the lab. Now, Microsoft has access, by the way, to, they don't do it quite the same way, but the University of Washington's man-machine interface group would approach this differently, but they probably could get a very similar uh, response. It's uh, carrying over from your, your last question, Joe. One of the things I think is, is really important is when we start to see comments like this being thrown around and, and 
people don't necessarily take them serious because they are fairly outlandish and they can be dismissed fairly easily. One of the things that does need to be taken more serious is the potential that these technologies have that we do know exist, either through past research or, or new research. One of the alarm bells I've been trying to raise forever and a day with AR since I saw it was visual perception in AR. You know, the, the brain is only capable of perceiving so much at any given time. We only have so much attention we can provide to any given situation. We only have so much perception we can provide to any given situation. And so if you put something in front of my eyes that's really cool, that makes me not want to take my eyes off it, and let's face it, when we, you know, we talk about persuasive technologies uh, and we go up to Stanford and we look at B.J. Fogg's work on uh, what he calls captology, computers as persuasive technology, we look at that and we know a lot of designers utilize these techniques to keep us engaged with their products because, let's face it, eyes on screen time equals money. We can look at that and say, okay, we know that this is the, you know, the, the desires to keep my eyes on the screen as long as possible. But what, what are the outcomes of that? What, what are the potentials? Neurologic issues? Mm, I don't think so. Neuroplasticity changes? I don't think so. But we do know things like inattentional blindness can occur because you can only pay so much attention to what we're looking at, be it on a first plane or a secondary plane. Research I just recently completed with Gary, we found that when we gave participants, we had a, a 112 participants, when we gave them a mobile phone, smartphone with an AR application running and they had a, an attention sustaining task. So they had to, they had to maintain their eyes on the AR element while still having full visibility of, of the real world background plane. When we introduced an unexpected object that 60% of the participants while engaged in this AR activity missed the unexpected object. Now, the unexpected object, in homage to uh, Simon Chabri, two famous cognitive psychologists, the unexpected object was a gorilla, a person in a gorilla suit walking across the street. Now, you wouldn't expect to see that in any you know normal situation in your life, but when the AR application was engaging enough for these people, they completely missed it. So it's important that we start to understand that AR and VR both have unbelievable opportunities for us in, in, in multitudes of ways. But there are things that are legit when it comes to the concerns about using this technology, and there are things that are not. Neuroplasticity, I don't think there's going to be a major issue uh, with neuroplasticity changes from using visual technologies. Brain damage, uh, no, I'm sorry. I, in, until we start doing serious interconnectivity, physical interconnectivity with technologies, where we're actually connecting these technologies to our neural pathways uh, in a physical way, simple introduction of visual stimuli is not going to cause brain damage. You know, there are cases where certain light patterns can be uh, shown and those with a predisposition to um, seizure disorders can have a seizure activated through light patterns. But I don't think that uh, the designers of optical technologies and visual technologies, they're aware of those kind of things. Not aware of some of these others, but they are aware of those kind of things. But I think that Abbott's comments, you know, getting back to him, I think they're overblown. <laughs> The, uh, the good news is that Facebook, Google, I'm guessing Yahoo, but I don't actually know, and others, uh, particularly venture capitalists and risk money that are behind these technologies, they're starting to ask the right question. So, yes. so Facebook and, and Google that, that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are many that I'm not, they ask the question, what's the impact of screen size on the user? So they don't necessarily mean this is bigger or that's smaller. They mean, what's the cognitive impact or what's the neuro impact? And they're starting to ask these questions. They're exactly the right question to ask. And then you take that question and extend it to the, uh, to the application itself. And now you're getting somewhere. So if you, if we said, you know, that AR has a lot of utility in the education world, what does that mean? You know, so if we said we can go into poorly performing middle schools in the urban centers in America and improve that through delivering material via AR or VR. What does that mean? And so these are the right questions, and, and people are starting to ask them. I, I, I was on a call this week about something that's happening with one of these companies, what they, they want to bring a, a whole neuroscience perspective to their entire worldwide marketing and design groups. That's really encouraging. So I, I think that there are things happening that people are now looking at this saying, okay, doing cool stuff is fine. Now, let's take this out of the cool stuff realm and say, how do we apply this in a variety of different categories? 
Gary, what I was going to say too is that you said they're asking the right questions, but they're asking, they have to ask the right people to ask the right questions. And it sounds Absolutely. like, it sounds like they're finally recognizing that because this, t- the type of research that you and Shane are doing is so important to kind of give them that insight. And it was kind of funny, you know, early on, you said that uh, you were consulting, and if these people would have listened to you, they would have saved two hundred and forty million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, well, these the, t- t- type the, of questions are important. You know, well, the, this is where a phone company, you know, I won't identify them, decided that they should compete with the world's major game developers. And they said, "Oh, we can do that. We're going to buy a big gaming center. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that." And uh, so, yep, we're ready to go, and then we're going to spend a. a, a ultimately. They brought me in. I went through with them all their strategies. We called a major meeting, and I had on the whiteboard 13 reasons why they weren't ready to launch. And the guy who was the director of this effort was totally ticked off. I mean, you could see the veins on the side of his neck sort of squeeze out around his white dress shirt. And he didn't speak to me after the meeting. He just stormed out of the room. And so one of the product managers said, so you're telling us we're not ready to launch. And I said, well, basically, I'm telling you, you shouldn't launch at all. You're a phone company. And having phone companies meet about content is one of the world's (laughs) most dangerous things. Right. (laughs) I got a very nice letter from the CEO of that company about 18 months later after they lost a fortune (laughs) saying, I really want to apologize for the way you were treated. But I particularly want to apologize for the fact that we (laughs) No attention to what you had to say. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, they, 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 they dug their own grave and jumped in. I think that companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Yahoo and uh, Qualcomm and, you know, uh, Intel and Cisco and all the rest that are, that have an interest in this field. I think they take it seriously enough to, to, uh, you know, to find, find resources, ask questions. I, uh, the days of the auteur CEO are pretty much over. Where do you go? I've got a gut feeling we should make something about uh, Shane and I know of a interesting story about a, a virtual dictionary that ended up costing a publisher about six million dollars. They never should have made, but it's a long story. I'll tell it some other day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to say, you know, you know, Shane, you talked about the the experiment with the gorilla walking, and I remember going to a conference and seeing. The old, you know, count how many times the people in the white sh- uh, shirts bounce mm-hmm. the basketball to each other. Right. And I watched the whole thing. And then he's like, did you see the gorilla? And then he, you know, pl- plays it again in slow-mo and you see the gorilla. I was convinced that there was no gorilla the first time. I'm like, There's, this guy's lying. I, I'm right. like, this is disingenuous. How dare you show a gorilla the second time? <laughs> and right. then I went back to the video and I'm like, oh my gosh, there was a gorilla walked right in front of me and I wasn't looking for it. So it's it's so true that you have to do these experiments to see what people are paying attention to. And, you know, when you start getting into VR and AR, um, it's so important. So guys, let's, let's wrap this up. What is the easiest way for people to get in touch with you? So Shane, what, what's the quickest way people, we're going to have all your info in the show notes, but what's a quick way that people can uh, reach out to you if they want to? Uh, you can reach me through LinkedIn, through Twitter. Um, you can shoot me a direct email. You'll have uh, all the information directly, but just my name, Shane Pace. Uh, and, and Joe will have the proper spelling of my name. Yes. Uh, yes. Shane Pace at Twitter uh, and Shane Pace on LinkedIn and then shane.g.pace at gmail.com. Nice. I, I'm on all that stuff, but the easiest way to do it is just ghair at fielding.edu. And uh, you'll have that. You've got that, too, in my bio, Joe. And so I, I have no problem at all with people sending me an email there. If they really want to contact me immediately, the only way to do that, I just kid everybody, that Skype. I'm, a, I'm addicted to Skype. <laughs> and uh, so if people want to get a hold of me in, in some real-time way, Skype is the way to go. Awesome. Guys, I really appreciate having you both on. I mean, it was just – we could have talked for hours and I hope maybe we can bring you back and, and kind of have these uh, these discussions on how technology uh, affects human behavior and, and everything that goes along with it. But uh, I really do appreciate you guys spending time and we're going to bring you back if that's okay one day. Sounds sure. Good. Yeah. We'll see you at AWE, right? Absolutely. I, I will yeah, be sure. there. We'll be doing a panel um, at AWE talking about some of these very topics. Awesome. Well, I'm going to be on AWE TV. I'm going to be the anchor there or the host. So we'll have to make sure that we um, get you guys on camera to talk about you know your your panel and, and everything, uh, all the good stuff that goes along with that. 
Well, that means, unlike this morning, that means I'll have to shave and everything, I guess. <laughs> yeah, put, and put some pants on, too. Okay. <laughs> hey, I have perfectly good sweatpants on. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, okay, Appreciate guys. It. We'll send you Thanks, off. Take Joe. care, guys. My pleasure.